Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. A walk to remember. That night, the rehearsal was at the Playhouse. It was the last one before the show opened, and we had a lot to do. Right after school. The boys in drama class had to load all the props in the classroom into the rented truck to take them to the playhouse. The only problem was that Eddie and I were the only two boys, and he's not exactly the most coordinated individual in history. We'd be walking through a doorway, carrying one of the heavier items, and his hoovil body would work against him. At every critical moment when I really needed his help to balance the load, he'd stumble over some dust or an insect on the floor, and the weight of the prop would come crashing down on my fingers, pinching them against the door jam in the most painful way possible. S S sorry, he'd say. D D did T H T H that hurt. I'd stifle the curses rising in my throat and bite out. Just don't do it again. But he couldn't stop himself from stumbling around any more than he could stop the rain from falling. By the time we'd finished loading and unloading everything, my fingers looked like Toby's, the roving handyman. And the worst thing was. I didn't even get a chance to eat before rehearsal started. Moving the props had taken three hours, and we didn't finish setting them up until a few minutes before everyone else arrived to begin. With everything else that had happened that day, suffice it to say, I was in a pretty bad mood. I ran through my lines without even thinking about them. And Miss Garber didn't say the word marvelous all night long. She had this concerned look in her eyes afterward, but Jamie simply smiled and told her not to worry, that everything was going to be all right. I knew Jamie was just trying to make things better for me, but when she asked me to walk her home, I told her no. The playhouse was in the middle of town, and to walk her home. I'd have to walk a good distance out of my way. Besides, I didn't want to be seen again doing it. But Miss Garber had overheard Jamie's request, and she said very firmly that I'd be glad to do it. You two can talk about the play, she said. Maybe you can work out the kinks. By kinks, of course, she meant me specifically. So once more, I ended up walking Jamie home, but she could tell I wasn't really in the mood to talk because I walked a little bit in front of her, my hands in my pockets, without even really turning back to see whether she was following. It went this way for the first few minutes, and I hadn't said a word to her. You're not in a very good mood, are you? She finally asked. You didn't even try tonight. You don't miss a thing, do you? I said sarcastically without looking at her. Maybe I can help, she offered. She said it kind of happily, which made me even a little angrier. I doubt it, I snapped. Maybe if you told me what was wrong. I didn't let her finish. Look, I said, stopping, turning to face her. I've just spent all day hauling crap. I haven't eaten since lunch, and now I have to trek a mile out of my way to make sure you get home. When we both know you don't even need me to do it. It was the first time I'd ever raised my voice to her. To tell you the truth, it felt kind of good.
It had been building up for a long time. Jamie was too surprised to respond, and I went on. And the only reason I'm doing this is because of your father, who doesn't even like me. This whole thing is dumb, and I wish I had never agreed to do it. You're just saying this because you're nervous about the play. I cut her off with a shake of my head. Once I got on a roll, it was sometimes hard for me to stop. I could take her optimism and cheerfulness only so long, and today wasn't the day to push me too far. Don't you get it? I said, exasperated. I'm not nervous about the play, I just don't want to be here. I don't want to walk you home, I don't want my friends to keep talking about me, and I don't want to spend time with you. You keep acting like we're friends, but we're not. We're not anything. I just want the whole thing to be over so I can go back to my normal life. She looked hurt by my outburst, and to be honest, I couldn't blame her. I see, was all she said. I waited for her to raise her voice at me, to defend herself, to make her case again, but she didn't. All she did was look toward the ground. I think part of her wanted to cry, but she didn't, and I finally stalked away, leaving her standing by herself. A moment later, though, I heard her start moving, too. She was about five yards behind me the rest of the way to her house, and she didn't try to talk to me again until she started up the walkway. I was already moving down the sidewalk when I heard her voice. Thank you for walking me home, Landon, she called out. I winced as soon as she said it. Even when I was mean to her face and said the most spiteful things, she could find some reason to thank me. She was just that kind of girl, and I think I actually hated her for it. Or rather, I think, I hated myself. Chapter 8 The night of the play was cool and crisp, the sky absolutely clear without a hint of clouds. We had to arrive an hour early, and I'd been feeling pretty bad all day about the way I'd talked to Jamie the night before. She'd never been anything but nice to me, and I knew that I'd been a jerk. I saw her in the hallways between classes, and I wanted to go up to apologize to her for what I'd said but she'd sort of slip back into the crowd before I got the chance. She was already at the playhouse by the time I finally arrived, and I saw her talking to Miss Garber and Hegbert, off to one side, over by the curtains. Everyone was in motion, working off nervous energy, but she seemed strangely lethargic. She hadn't put on her costume yet, she was supposed to wear a white, flowing dress to give that angelic appearance, and she was still wearing the same sweater she'd worn at school. Despite my trepidation at how she might react, I walked up to the three of them. Hey, Jamie, I said. Hello, Reverend. Miss Garber. Jamie turned to me. Hello, Landon, she said quietly. I could tell she'd been thinking about the night before, too, because she didn't smile at me like she always did when she saw me. I asked if I could talk to her alone, and the two of us excused ourselves. I could see Hegbert and Miss Garber watching us as we took a few steps off to the side out of hearing distance. I glanced around the stage nervously. I'm sorry about those things I said last night, 
I began. I know they probably hurt your feelings, and I was wrong to have said them. She looked at me, as if wondering whether to believe me. Did you mean those things you said, she finally asked. I was just in a bad mood, that's all. I get sort of wound up sometimes. I knew I hadn't really answered her question. I see, she said. She said it as she had the night before, then turned toward the empty seats in the audience. Again she had that sad look in her eyes. Look, I said, reaching for her hand, I promise to make it up to you. Don't ask me why I said it, it just seemed like the right thing to do at that moment. For the first time that night, she began to smile. Thank you, she said, turning to face me. Jamie? Jamie turned. Yes, Miss Garber. I think we're about ready for you. Miss Garber was motioning with her hand. I've got to go, she said to me. I know. Break a leg. I said. Wishing someone luck before a play is supposed to be bad luck. That's why everyone tells you to break a leg. I let go of her hand. We both will. I promise. After that, we had to get ready, and we went our separate ways. I headed toward the men's dressing room. The playhouse was fairly sophisticated, considering that it was located in Beaufort, with separate dressing rooms that made us feel as if we were actual actors, as opposed to students. My costume, which was kept at the playhouse, was already in the dressing room. Earlier in the rehearsals we'd had our measurements taken so that they could be altered, and I was getting dressed when Eric walked in the door unannounced. Eddie was still in the dressing room, putting on his mute bum's costume, and when he saw Eric he got a look of terror in his eyes. At least once a week Eric gave him a wedgie, and Eddie kind of hightailed it out of there as fast as he could, pulling one leg up on his costume on the way out the door. Eric ignored him and sat on the dressing table in front of the mirror. So, Eric said with a mischievous grin on his face, what are you going to do? I looked at him curiously. What do you mean? I asked. About the play, stupid. You gonna flub up your lines or something? I shook my head. No. You gonna knock the props over. Everyone knew about the props. I hadn't planned on it, I answered stoically. You mean you're going to do this thing straight up? I nodded. Thinking otherwise hadn't even occurred to me. He looked at me for a long time, as if he were seeing someone he'd never seen before. I guess you're finally growing up, Landon, he said at last. Coming from Eric. I wasn't sure whether it was intended as a compliment. Either way, though, I knew he was right. In the play, Tom Thornton is amazed when he first sees the angel, which is why he goes around helping her as she shares Christmas with those less fortunate. The first words out of Tom's mouth are, You're beautiful and I was supposed to say them as if I meant them from the bottom of my heart. This was the pivotal moment in the entire play, and it sets the tone for everything else that happens afterward. 
The problem, however, was that I still hadn't nailed this line yet. Sure, I said the words, but they didn't come off too convincingly, seeing as I probably said the words like anyone would when looking at Jamie, with the exception of Hegbert. It was the only scene where Miss Garber had never said the word marvellous, so I was nervous about it. I kept trying to imagine someone else as the angel so that I could get it just right, but with all the other things I was trying to concentrate on, it kept getting lost in the shuffle. Jamie was still in her dressing room when the curtains finally opened. I didn't see her beforehand, but that was okay. The first few scenes didn't include her anyway, they were mainly about Tom Thornton and his relationship with his daughter. Now, I didn't think I'd be too nervous when I stepped out on stage, being that I'd rehearsed so much, but it hits you right between the eyes when it actually happens. The playhouse was absolutely packed, and as Miss Garber had predicted, they'd had to set up two extra rows of seats all the way across the back. Normally the place sat 400, but with those seats there were at least another 50 people sitting down. In addition, people were standing against the walls, packed like sardines. As soon as I stepped on stage, everyone was absolutely quiet. The crowd, I noticed, was mainly old ladies of the blue-haired type, the kind that play bingo and drink Bloody Marys at Sunday brunch, though I could see Eric sitting with all my friends near the back row. It was downright eerie, if you know what I mean to be standing in front of them while everyone waited for me to say something. So I did the best I could to put it out of my mind as I did the first few scenes in the play. Sally, the one-eyed wonder, was playing my daughter, by the way, because she was sort of small, and we went through our scenes just as we'd rehearsed them. Neither of us blew our lines, though we weren't spectacular or anything. When we closed the curtains for Act 2, we had to quickly reset the props. This time everyone pitched in, and my fingers escaped unscathed because I avoided Eddie at all costs. I still hadn't seen Jamie, I guess she was exempt from moving props because her costume was made of light material and would rip if she caught it on one of those nails, but I didn't have much time to think about her because of all we had to do. The next thing I knew, the curtain was opening again and I was back in Hegbert Sullivan's world, walking past storefronts and looking in windows for the music box my daughter wants for Christmas. My back was turned from where Jamie entered, but I heard the crowd collectively draw a breath as soon as she appeared on stage. I thought it was silent before, but now it went absolutely hush still. Just then, from the corner of my eye and off to the side of the stage, I saw Hegbert's jaw quivering. I readied myself to turn around, and when I did, I finally saw what it was all about. For the first time since I'd known her, her honey-coloured hair wasn't pulled into a tight bun. Instead it was hanging loosely, longer than I imagined, reaching below her shoulder blades. There was a trace of glitter in her hair, and it caught the stage lights, sparkling like a crystal halo. Set against her flowing white dress tailored exactly for her, it was absolutely amazing to behold. She didn't look like the girl I'd grown up with or the girl I'd come recently to know. She wore a touch of makeup, too, not a lot just enough to bring out the softness of her features. She was smiling slightly, as if she were holding a secret close to her heart, 
just like the part called for her to do. She looked exactly like an angel. I know my jaw dropped a little, and I just stood there looking at her for what seemed like a long time, shocked into silence, until I suddenly remembered that I had a line I had to deliver. I took a deep breath, then slowly let it out. You're beautiful, I finally said to her, and I think everyone in the whole auditorium, from the blue-haired ladies in front to my friends in the back row, knew that I actually meant it. I'd nailed that line for the very first time. Chapter 9 To say that the play was a smashing success was to put it mildly. The audience laughed and the audience cried, which is pretty much what they were supposed to do. But because of Jamie's presence, it really became something special and I think everyone in the cast was as shocked as I was at how well the whole thing had come off. They all had that same look I did when I first saw her, and it made the play that much more powerful when they were performing their parts. We finished the first performance without a hitch, and the next evening even more people showed up, if you can believe it. Even Eric came up to me afterward and congratulated me, which after what he'd said to me before was somewhat of a surprise. The two of you did good, he said simply. I'm proud of you, buddy. While he said it, Miss Garber was crying out, marvellous, to anyone who would listen to her or who just happened to be walking past, repeating it over and over so much that I kept on hearing it long after I went to bed that night. I looked for Jamie after we'd pulled the curtains closed for the final time, and spotted her off to the side, with her father. He had tears in his eyes, it was the first time I'd ever seen him cry, and Jamie went into his arms, and they held each other for a long time. He was stroking her hair and whispering, my angel, to her while her eyes were closed, and even I felt myself choking up. The right thing, I realized, wasn't so bad after all. After they finally let go of each other, Hegbert proudly motioned for her to visit with the rest of the cast, and she got a boatload of congratulations from everyone backstage. She knew she'd done well, though she kept on telling people she didn't know what all the fuss was about. She was her normal cheerful self, but with her looking so pretty, it came across in a totally different way. I stood in the background, letting her have her moment, and I'll admit there was a part of me that felt like old Hegbert. I couldn't help but be happy for her, and a little proud as well. When she finally saw me standing off to one side, she excused herself from the others and walked over, finally stopping when she was close. Looking up at me. She smiled. Thank you, Landon, for what you did. You made my father very happy. You're welcome, I said, meaning it. The strange thing was, when she said it, I realized that Hegbert would be driving her home, and for once I wished that I would have had the opportunity to walk her there. The following Monday was our last week of school before Christmas break, and finals were scheduled in every class. In addition, I had to finish my application for UNC, which I'd sort of been putting off because of all the rehearsals. I planned on hitting the books pretty hard that week, then doing the application at night before I went to bed. Even so, I couldn't help but think about Jamie. 
Jamie's transformation during the play had been startling, to say the least, and I assumed it had signaled a change in her. I don't know why I thought that way, but I did, and so I was amazed when she showed up our first morning back dressed like her usual self, brown sweater, hair in a bun, plaid skirt, and all. One look was all it took, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for her. She'd been regarded as normal even special over the weekend, or so it had seemed, but she'd somehow let it slip away. Oh, people were a little nicer to her, and the ones who hadn't talked to her yet told her what a good job she'd done, too, but I could tell right off that it wasn't going to last. Attitudes forged since childhood are hard to break, and part of me wondered if it might even get worse for her after this. Now that people actually knew she could look normal, they might even become more heartless. I wanted to talk to her about my impressions, I really did, but I was planning to do so after the week was over. Not only did I have a lot to do, but I wanted a little time to think of the best way to tell her. To be honest, I was still feeling a little guilty about the things I'd said to her on our last walk home, and it wasn't just because the play had turned out great. It had more to do with the fact that in all our time together, Jamie had never once been anything but kind, and I knew that I'd been wrong. I didn't think she wanted to talk to me, either, to tell you the truth. I knew she could see me hanging out with my friends at lunch while she sat off in the corner, reading her Bible, but she never made a move toward us. But as I was leaving school that day, I heard her voice behind me, asking me if I wouldn't mind walking her home. Even though I wasn't ready to tell her yet about my thoughts, I agreed. For old time's sake, you see. A minute later Jamie got down to business. Do you remember those things you said on our last walk home, she asked. I nodded, wishing she hadn't brought it up. You promised to make it up to me she said. For a moment I was confused. I thought I'd done that already with my performance in the play. Jamie went on. Well, I've been thinking about what you could do, she continued without letting me get a word in edgewise, and this is what I've come up with. She asked if I wouldn't mind gathering the pickle jars and coffee cans she'd set out in businesses all over town early in the year. They sat on the counters, usually near the cash registers, so that people could drop their loose change in. The money was to go to the orphans. Jamie never wanted to ask people straight out for the money, she wanted them to give voluntarily. That, in her mind, was the Christian thing to do. I remembered seeing the containers in places like Cecil's Diner and the Crown Theatre. My friends and I used to toss paper clips and slugs in there when the cashiers weren't looking, since they sounded sort of like a coin being dropped inside, then we'd chuckle to ourselves about how we were putting something over on Jamie. We used to joke about how she'd open one of her cans, expecting something good because of the weight, and she'd dump it out and find nothing but slugs and paper clips. Sometimes, when you remember the things you used to do, it makes you wince, and that's exactly what I did. Jamie saw the look on my face. You don't have to do it, she said obviously disappointed. I was just thinking that since Christmas is coming up so quickly and I don't have a car, 
It'll simply take me too long to collect them all. No, I said cutting her off, I'll do it. I don't have much to do anyway. So that's what I did starting Wednesday, even though I had tests to study for, even with that application needing to be finished. Jamie had given me a list of every place she'd placed a can, and I borrowed my mom's car and started at the far end of town the following day. She'd put out about 60 cans in all, and I figured that it would take only a day to collect them all. Compared to putting them out, it would be a piece of cake. It had taken Jamie almost six weeks to do because she'd first had to find 60 empty jars and cans and then she could put out only two or three a day since she didn't have a car and could carry only so many at a time. When I started out, I felt sort of funny about being the one who picked up the cans and jars being that it was Jamie's project, but I kept telling myself that Jamie had asked me to help. I went from business to business, collecting the cans and jars, and by end of the first day I realized it was going to take a little longer than I'd thought. I'd picked up only about 20 containers or so, because I'd forgotten one simple fact of life in Beaufort. In a small town like this, it was impossible to simply run inside and grab the can without chatting with the proprietor or saying hello to someone else you might recognize. It just wasn't done. So I'd sit there while some guy would be talking about the marlin he'd hooked last fall, or they'd ask me how school was going and mention that they needed a hand unloading a few boxes in the back or maybe they wanted my opinion on whether they should move the magazine rack over to the other side of the store. Jamie, I knew, would have been good at this, and I tried to act like I thought she would want me to. It was her project after all. To keep things moving, I didn't stop to check the take-in between the businesses. I just dumped one jar or can into the next combining them as I went along. By the end of the first day all the change was packed in two large jars, and I carried them up to my room. I saw a few bills through the glass, not too many, but I wasn't actually nervous until I emptied the contents onto my floor and saw that the change consisted primarily of pennies. Though there weren't nearly as many slugs or paper clips as I'd thought there might be, I was still disheartened when I counted up the money. There was $20.32. Even in 1958 that wasn't a lot of money, especially when divided among 30 kids. I didn't get discouraged, though. Thinking that it was a mistake, I went out the next day, hauled a few dozen boxes, and chatted with another twenty proprietors while I collected cans and jars. The take, $23.89. The third day was even worse. After counting up the money, even I couldn't believe it. There was only $11.52. Those were from the businesses down by the waterfront, where the tourists and teenagers like me hung out. We were really something, I couldn't help but think. Seeing how little had been collected in all, $55.73 made me feel awful especially considering that the jars had been out for almost a whole year and that I myself had seen them countless times. That night I was supposed to call Jamie to tell her the amount I'd collected, but I just couldn't do it. She'd told me how she'd wanted something extra special this year, and this wasn't going to do it even I knew that. 
Instead I lied to her and told her that I wasn't going to count the total until the two of us could do it together, because it was her project, not mine. It was just too depressing. I promised to bring over the money the following afternoon, after school let out. The next day was December 21st, the shortest day of the year. Christmas was only four days away. Land on, she said to me after counting it up, this is a miracle. How much is there? I asked. I knew exactly how much it was. There's almost $247 here. She was absolutely joyous as she looked up at me. Since Hegbert was home, I was allowed to sit in the living room, and that's where Jamie had counted the money. It was stacked in neat little piles all over the floor, almost all quarters and dimes. Hegbert was in the kitchen at the table, writing his sermon, and even he turned his head when he heard the sound of her voice. Do you think that's enough? I asked innocently. Little tears were coming down her cheeks as she looked around the room, still not believing what she was seeing right in front of her. Even after the play, she hadn't been nearly this happy. She looked right at me. It's wonderful, she said, smiling. There was more emotion than I'd ever heard in her voice before. Last year, I only collected $70. I'm glad it worked out better this year, I said through the lump that had formed in my throat. If you hadn't placed those jars out so early in the year, you might not have collected nearly as much. I know I was lying, but I didn't care. For once, it was the right thing to do. I didn't help Jamie pick out the toys, I figured she'd know better what the kids would want anyway, but she'd insisted that I go with her to the orphanage on Christmas Eve so that I could be there when the children opened their gifts. Please, land on, she'd said, and with her being so excited and all, I just didn't have the heart to turn her down. So three days later, while my father and mother were at a party at the mayor's house, I dressed in a houndstooth jacket and my best tie and walked to my mom's car with Jamie's present beneath my arm. I'd spent my last few dollars on a nice sweater because that was all I could think to get her. She wasn't exactly the easiest person to shop for. I was supposed to be at the orphanage at seven but the bridge was up near the Moorhead city port, and I had to wait until an outbound freighter slowly made its way down the channel. As a result, I arrived a few minutes late. The front door was already locked by that time, and I had to pound on it until Mr. Jenkins finally heard me. He fiddled through his set of keys until he found the right one, and a moment later he opened the door. I stepped inside, patting my arms to ward off the chill, 